so hopefully I will stay that way. Um, as you heard, I am a clinical psychologist. I am uh, certified in perinatal mental health. I have been a specialist in this area for almost 27 years. Um, it is my lifeblood, it is my passion. I teach all about the intersection of um, AIP and EMDR through the range of perinatal issues. Um, and I could stand here all day and talk to you about those issues. Um, but today we're going to be talking about a very narrow slice of, of perinatal mental health and its intersection with EMDR. Um, we are going to be talking, as you know, about this perennial question that comes up really around the world. This is not just the North American question. Um, I've just come from EMDR Europe, where I presented on this, um, presented virtually at EMDR Australia, um, presented at the summit here, the virtual summit, and will be presenting twice more in the fall in Israel and Russia, because this question about the use of EMDR therapy during pregnancy is a question that comes up quite a bit, and it comes up um, because I think questions about all kinds of treatments, um, medical, psychological, um, around pregnancy are very common questions um, for clinicians because we, we, of course, all want to do right by our clients um, and certainly by, by pregnancies and developing fetus and baby. So the question tends to be something along the lines of, is it safe to, and the usual question tends to be something like, do EMDR reprocessing, then there's the second part of the question, can I do EMDR reprocessing during this part of pregnancy, this part of pregnancy, this part of pregnancy, what will happen? So, so the question is an excellent question. So here's why I'm here today. I'm here because there are so many answers. If any of you are in social media, and not just social media, I want to say that the answers that I'm going to show you that I have heard each of these more than once, meaning from more than one source over the last, however, I've been trained in EMDR more than 20 years. January will be 21 years, okay? I got trained in EMDR specifically to work with the perinatal population, okay? So I've, you know, these questions have come up for, for a long time. Um, and, and the answers that come up range, and, he, and, and you'll see why, my struggle and my desire to come here and talk to you today and talk you through how to think about this question comes from the kinds of answers that I've seen over the years. For example, never during the first trimester. Never during the last trimester. Only if it's about this pregnancy. Only if it's not about this pregnancy. Only phase two. I've done it. It was fine. Be careful not to trigger labor. Okay, I just need to pause and tell you that if I could trigger labor by doing reprocessing, I would have a line outside my door and I would not need to be doing therapy. Okay? We don't, the truth is, we don't know how to start labor and we don't know how to stop labor. New, don't do it. Not if the pregnancy is high risk. We're going to talk about this because I have a lot to say about high risk. What does that mean? What does it not mean? Not if it's after infertility. It's a liability issue. <laughs> Something happens to the pregnancy, clients are going to think it's about the EMDR. Always do it, because it's going to help with bonding, which we'll talk about. Don't cortisol something about cortisol. Okay. We are going to address all of these. Oh, here we go. Here's another one. I did it, and client decompensated. I would argue that's an EMDR issue, not a pregnancy issue. Okay? I'm uncomfortable. I prefer to wait. Y'all? You're uncomfortable, okay? Got a really good therapy for that. <laughs> okay. I think 
it's unethical <laughs> to do a processing during pregnancy. Okay? That's a sample. That's a sample. Okay? I want to pause here and say that everybody and anybody who has given one of these answers, either privately or on social media, has good intentions. Okay? We are all doing our best here. And most clinicians in the world, and certainly in the EMDR world, are not specialists in perinatal mental health. And in order to answer this question, in fact, in order to know how to even think about what you need to know to answer this question, you really do need to understand EMDR, and you really need to understand the issues in perinatal mental health. And so today, I'm going to walk you through, step by step, block by block, the issues that, that I think are important um, in order to be able to know how to answer the question and why the answer is what it is for any given client. Now, who in here would identify themselves as somebody who specializes in perinatal, perinatal mental health or kind of wants to specialize in perinatal mental health, sees this population? Okay, so maybe 40% and 30% in the room? Okay. So it's important to, to, to consider that everybody in this room has had, does have, or will have a perinatal issue walk through their door. Now clients aren't issues, but you know what I mean, okay? We have parents, some of us are parents. We have family members, friends, neighbors, coworkers who are in the reproductive period. Things happen and they impact us. So understanding these clinical presentations and understanding that even if you say, well, I don't work with that population, it's kind of not how it works. It's a little bit like when people say, oh, I don't work with trauma. <laughs> okay, so here we are. Well, let me tell you some stuff that I hope will help you. And that's my goal today, is to help you understand um, why is this so important? Well, first of all, we want to understand, oh, actually, tell you a little bit about clinical, clinical presentations. For those of you who are not getting referrals of perinatal clients, you, would have, you may have a client who gets pregnant over the course of your treatment, right? You may have someone who um, just had a pregnancy loss. And that may not be what brought them in, but that's part of their history. They may have had a traumatic birth that may not be what brought them in. And they, they may in fact be pregnant again, and that may be in their mind incidental to why they're there. Um, but just know that this, this can walk through your door. You also may see clients who are, are in treatment with you, and the pregnancy itself activates old trauma that was not actually present front and center um, in the current work that you were doing. And a lot of that has to do with the neuroendocrine changes that happen over the course of pregnancy and how somatic, how body-based pregnancy is and how activating that can be. And as we heard this morning, I kept wanting to jump up and cheer during Ruth Lanius' talk. Yes, this is what we're going to talk about this afternoon. Because this all lives in the body and think about pregnancy and how absolutely visceral it is, right? And how, how all-encompassing in terms of embodiment um, it can be, and kind of triggering that can be for trauma survivors, um, no matter what the cause of trauma is. And we're going to, I'm going to talk you through a little bit some of the prevalence rates here, because again, you might say, okay, that's fine. So maybe somebody comes in my in my office and they're, you know, they become pregnant or they happen to be pregnant. But uh, how how common is this anyway? Well, about 213 million live births a year. It doesn't count stillbirths, miscarriages, okay? About 15% of birthing people will go on to develop either full-blown PTSD or subclinical but significant symptoms of PTSD. That's more than 25 million people a year worldwide. Some of them might call us. It's a lot of people. It's a lot of potential people that we need to be thinking very carefully about withholding or providing this very effective treatment for. 
So how common is trauma in the perinatal period, specifically? Well, the greatest risk of a, a person who is pregnant having been traumatized is, about, is also about 15%. The, the, the greatest cause, the greatest risk factor, unsurprisingly, is a history of, of child sexual abuse. Okay? And there are going to be many, many, many people who become pregnant who have that history and are surprised that they're activated even more than they might have been in other situations as a result of these changes that happen in pregnancy. And it's just not just the physiology of pregnancy, it's also the meaning making around pregnancy. Um, I had a client many years ago who had been terribly abused in childhood by um, lots of you know, young teenage boys and found out that she was pregnant with a boy. And the, the, the physical experience and sense of, of what it meant to have a boy child with boy parts inside her was incredibly activating for her. Okay. So there's, and, and that's just one example. You can imagine um, how much meaning can be attached to, to what does it mean to be a parent if I didn't really have parents who parent? <coughs> right? What kind of parent am I going to be? And this gets us into kind of the perinatal um, issues around, you know, the perinatal period is a developmental period. And so another reason why this topic is so very important is that we are working with people at the cusp of development of a very important period in their lives, individually, their lives as a family, and certainly the lives of their child or children who are about to be born or who have already been born. I mean, this is the touchstone. This is the center of what we do. It's super important. So we have people who come in having been traumatized from, from other stuff, but we also have people who come in um, with trauma related to things that have happened during a prior pregnancy or the current pregnancy. And I want to, to talk about what is perinatal trauma, and I want to spend just a few minutes on this because what I have noticed over the last 26, 27 years of doing this work is that clinicians who haven't had the opportunity to learn about this field are often really nervous about the medical kinds of things that can happen across the perinatal period. It's sort of not sure what's normal, typical, not sure what will be supportive, what won't be supportive, what does harm, what doesn't do harm, and so they refer out. Right? And at certain points, like, we're full, y'all. <laughs> we, need, we need you to come. Come. We'll help. This community is an incredibly warm and generous community, and we want to support you in feeling and being competent, not afraid, and certainly not alone. You know, there's a real parallel here to what we want for parents, too, right? Parents also are beginners. <laughs> They're, they feel alone, they feel incompetent, right? We want to help you to know that you can do this too and, and, here, and here we are to do it for, with you. So the perinatal period in, in the per, in, and the trauma that happens in this period relates to the time, now I define this as the time, from the, the time you start to think about conception. Now, there will be people who will argue with me that that is not perinatal, that's prior, but I think that as soon as you start to think about wanting to conceive, wanting to be a parent, you're, you've, and you've started on the journey through pregnancy, birthing, and through the first three years of life. Now, I am a child psychologist by training. So once a child psychologist, always a child psychologist, and you're not gonna tell me that the perinatal period adds, ad, ends at 30 days or even one year. No, you are not. So, <laughs> three years, because we know this, right? We know this is our early, our early childhood period, right? Where all of this attachment, all of this sense of self develops, Right, so this is, this is how I think of this conceptually. So the prevalence rates for perinatal trauma uh, range. And if you look at the bibliography that, I've, that is attached, um, you can read any and all of, of the studies. I am not gonna pepper you with statistics, okay? In general, I mean, I'm gonna give you some, some idea of like where you're likely to see a bigger impact or more prevalence, but actually, 
actually what I'm going to do is spend about five minutes showing you the kinds of things that can happen that are traumatizing in the perinatal period. So I want to pause for a second and acknowledge that these kinds of things, even just naming them, can be activating for people. Some people in this room have experienced some of those things. Okay, So please take a moment and just find something to ground yourself because people are often surprised actually. They get like kind of emotional um, in hearing about like this kind of long list of things that can happen. Um, you know, just to be aware, like, do what you need to do um, if you find yourselves activated. And also just know that the, the Touchstone team, we love to talk to people. <laughs> so if something gets stirred up and you want to talk, just come to, come to our table later. And we are happy, happy to talk to you. So, so it starts with complications around becoming pregnant. All kinds of infertility and the, the diagnostic tests and the treatments for infertility can be incredibly physically painful and also traumatizing. Third-party reproduction, that means using donor gametes, eggs and sperm, um, surrogates, gestational carriers, um, being a birth parent, um, but not raising that baby, bringing that baby home. Okay. Secondary infertility can be quite a shock. That means you've had a live birth and then can't get pregnant again. Okay. So, so if, in a, if this was a different lecture, we could be talking about the environmental, the systemic, the interpersonal, the developmental impacts of all of this. But again, you may have clients in your office who have experienced some of this, and that may not be what brought them in, but it's part of their tapestry. Then there's complications during pregnancy. Now, there are many kinds of complications during pregnancy, and I've given you kind of like the fan favorites, like the, the, the big ones. Um, Preterm labor, meaning going into labor before a, um, a baby is viable, can live outside the uterus, or when it's really not advisable, we would prefer that baby not be born that early. Um, I'm sure, especially in the climate here in North America, um, people may even now have more familiarity with these conversations about viability um, and about when can a baby live outside the womb. I can tell you from a neonatology perspective, 22, 23 weeks is it. And part of that has to do with the skin. The skin is too gelatinous before then. You can't put a sensor on it. You can't give the kind of medical support that you need to before then. Um, but you really don't want your baby born at 23 weeks if you can avoid it. Um, Preeclampsia or HELP syndrome. Um, is a, a, a sort of a, a high blood pressure uh, illness that can also trigger preterm labor, can be dangerous both to the pregnant person and to the baby. Now, the prevalence rates of, of, of post-traumatic stress in these kinds of um, disorders are between about 15 and 25% of people, okay? So it's not like, well, I had this thing happen and then I had the baby and then I was okay. And hyperemesis, by the way, which is that unremitting vomiting, Kate Middleton gets it every time she gets pregnant. About 40% of people who give birth who have had hyperemesis in a pregnancy will go on to develop PTSD. Okay, so, so this is just for your reference. I'm not going to describe each of these. Um, but you can see, like, there's a lot of things that could happen that can impact your medical health, that can impact your sense of self, that can make you afraid for the health of your unborn baby. Something like an ectopic pregnancy is dangerous to life. An ectopic pregnancy is a pregnancy, um, an embryo that implants in the tube, or really anywhere except the uterus. We cannot move an embryo from one location to another. That's a really good science fiction story and something that we hopefully will one day be able to do. It is not a thing currently. It is wish casting. There are complications that people have during birthing. Now, when people think about um, birthing birth trauma or perinatal trauma, this is what people think we're talking about. Trauma during giving birth. And certainly that happens. And it can happen with medical complications to the birthing person. It can happen when the delivery itself is traumatizing physically to the baby, to the, to the mother or other birthing person. 
when the baby is taken away for one reason or another, um, because of concern. Preterm delivery itself is really traumatizing. This is not what's supposed to happen. And it's really, it's really overwhelming. The can baby is taken off into the NICU. Okay? There is obstetric violence as well around the world. It's really important to acknowledge that. Um, we need to believe people when they tell us they're in pain. We need to believe people when they tell us something's wrong. And we need physicians and nurses um, who are taking care of themselves well enough to not do harm. Of course, there's perinatal death, which can happen at any point during pregnancy. Uh, a death uh, that happens in utero prior to 20 weeks is called a miscarriage. After 20 weeks is called a stillbirth. Um, and babies can die once they're home. They can die in newborn intensive care. They can die in their crib. They can die in their bassinet. They can die in bed next to a parent who's done all the right things. There's also pregnancy termination when there is a poor prenatal diagnosis. There's all kinds of diagnoses. You know, people get ultrasounds and testing all through the first and second trimester, and it can feel kind of like, woohoo, I'm gonna get pictures of the baby. And people forget that the results are not always great. And then people are faced with decisions. So you, again, you could have a client in your office who is pregnant, you know, well, let's go back to talking about what we're talking about, working on what we're working on. And then all of a sudden they come in and say, I just had a 20 week ultrasound and my baby has no brain. Just the brain stuff. And right, so what do, you, what do you do as a clinician? This, this can absolutely happen. So there are many, many, many reasons why somebody in your office may be holding trauma in their bodies. And very commonly, somebody who has experienced one of the things that I just showed you on these last slides comes in when they're pregnant again. That's when they come in. Because now they're worried about the pregnancy, and they're worried about delivery, and they're worried about parenting, and they're worried about the baby. They sort of white knuckle it until there's another pregnancy. So here we have all, all of this need, right? So let's take a minute and just talk about efficacy because, you know, listen, if EMDR isn't helpful to people in this period, then we have nothing to talk about, right? Then there's nothing to be done. But let's just take a minute and talk about efficacy. So when we talk about efficacy, we talk about mitigation. What does it help uh, get rid of that's painful, and what does it support developmentally? So what it mitigates is absolutely the PTSD from a prior traumatic birth. It reduces anxiety about childbirth. And in fact, there's a study that came out last month that looked at, at EMDR and treatment as, as usual in pregnant people who were afraid of um, labor and delivery and looking at C-section rates and induction rates. There's lots and lots of reasons why somebody would end up with a C-section, a surgical delivery. And there's a lot of reasons why, it's too many reasons, that people get induced, and very often that leads to C-section. But requesting an early induction is sort of like, I'm done being pregnant, <laughs> can I we move on? Um, the people who received EMDR treatment were seven times less likely to request induction than people who got treatment as usual. Okay, so that improves outcomes, and and also there were there's safety data as well, which we'll talk about in a minute. I know I'm, not, I'm taking a while to get to the safety stuff that you really want to hear about. <laughs> it also supports mobilization of traumatic grief. It supports bonding because it removes the shrapnel, it builds uh, connective tissue is the way I think about it. You know, Dini Laliotis this morning talked about, this, Ruth Ladney has talked about the sense of self, the sense of attachment, right? I call that connective tissue building. Um, the trauma can really shred, and so we're supporting the building and rebuilding of connective tissue. Um, and helping parents to be able to be present in the present moment, right? The default mode network, right? We want them here. We want them present, we want them responsive and attuned, and EMDR, supports that. We have lots of data. Look at the bibliography. So, why is there so much worry about this? So here's what, we are, what we've got. This, this is the only mention of pregnancy in Shapiro's work. The 
Potential effects of aroused emotion on women who are pregnant should also be taken into account. While to date there have been no reports of serious physical side effects, it is always better to use caution. That's it. That's all we got. Okay. So what do we make of that? How do you know what heuristics are? Heuristics are decisional shortcuts that we all use and we need to use because otherwise we'd be reinventing the wheel all the time. Okay? We, we were able to kind of jump from one point to another more quickly using heuristics. Now, the, the, the thing about heuristics that's good is it helps us to function more rapidly and respond better. However, heuristics leave us also prone to cognitive distortion and cognitive error. And in medicine, there are actually a long list of very, very common cognitive errors that are essentially heuristics. And this is one of them. And it's called the omission bias. The omission bias is this tendency to judge action as more harmful than inaction. And there seems to be some sense that, um, and this is Kahneman, Kahneman's work, Daniel Kahneman's work, um, about how our brains work and how we, how we understand ourselves. Like, if I do something and something bad happens, then I'm more inclined to say, oh no, I've done something wrong. Whereas if I didn't do something, there's less tendency to do that. And people will use this do no harm with the do being the active, <laughs> literally the active word in that sentence, right? So there is this tension. So this is why people will refuse medication. They'll refuse, for example, vaccination. They'll refuse. Um, one of the classic medical examples is somebody who's at risk of um, a stroke from blood clotting doesn't want to take um, a blood thinner because of the risk that they, a very small risk that they might um, hemorrhage, but the risk of the blood clot is actually higher, right? So the, the cost of inaction is higher than the cost of action. So, so the way that we address omission bias is by weighing the costs and benefits of action and the costs and benefits of inaction. So let's look at that. So what is it that we're weighing here? What are people so afraid of? Stress. We don't want to stress the pregnant person. We don't want to stress the pregnancy. We don't want to stress the baby. Okay. So stress isn't just one thing. There's different kinds of stress. Not all stress is the same. And we really need to understand these different kinds of stress in order to think through these decisions. So there's a, a taxonomy that, oh now I'm forgetting the place where it comes from, um, that is all about child development that has laid out the three kinds of stress and the impacts of these kinds of stress. And the first is toxic stress. And toxic stress refers to constant, unremitting, aversive, generally environmental, but could also be chronic illness, um, on the body and the brain. And when we're talking about pregnancy, I'm going to tell you the impact of toxic stress um, on the person and all these different dimensions of what we need to be concerned about during pregnancy. Toxic stress would be things like racism, misogyny, uh, ongoing uh, intimate partner violence, um, war, uh, exposure to, to, to discrimination in a, in a pervasive way, which we know a systemic kind of way. Okay, and we're going to see the impact of that in a minute. Toxic stress has an impact on the pregnant person, and we need to remember there is a person 
human person who is pregnant, who is suffering while pregnant, but also a person. So I just want to make sure we all remember that. that there is a person who deserves treatment, right, deserves to not suffer, and we need to be thinking about that person. When somebody is pregnant and, and experiencing toxic stress, it has, by the time they're pregnant and in your office, they have experienced toxic stress, right? So this is not like, today I'm feeling toxic stress. So this is like, this has been going on, okay? Um, there are higher rates of uh, substance use, tobacco use, right? There are, I have so many things to tell you. Um, that then subsequently impact also the pregnancy and the developing fetus, okay? Toxic stress impacts the status of pregnancy itself, okay? We see um, higher rates of obstetric complications, right? So we see things like low birth weight, preterm birth, higher rates of gestational diabetes, Okay, higher rates of preeclampsia. See all these pregnancy complications that come about subsequent to experiencing toxic stress. And I think this is a good time to point out that we know that, that marginalized and minoritized populations have higher rates of obstetric complications than those who are not in those minoritized statuses. Now I'm sure you have all heard that um, black Birthing people are five times more likely to die, not just during pregnancy and birth, but in the postpartum period as well, and their babies are more likely to die. This is with controls for demographics. Okay. This is probably part of what we're seeing when we're looking at medical sequela from, the, from when we look at the ACE questions, right? Some of these early loss, early abuse, early misattunement, right? Early developmental rupture, early and ongoing. You know, we're not talking about the one, you know, the one time that, you know, mom was sick and couldn't be responsive for, you know, a week or two even, right? We're talking about <coughs> these long-term kinds of impacts. So we're seeing, so we see higher rates of all of these complications, which of course, um, have an impact then on the baby. You know, we, we don't want to see um, a baby born preterm if we can avoid it. Because if you want to open up the outcome research on babies who are in the NICU, babies who are premature, um, you're really going to need to ground yourselves and really um, be prepared because it's not pretty. We see impacts also on the development of this fetus. And it doesn't end when they are born. So here's the thing you need to understand. The intensity and the ongoing nature of the stress, of toxic stress, changes the neuroendocrine system of this developing fetus, this baby. And when the baby is born, we see more difficulty with stress tolerance, we see fewer adaptive behaviors through preschool and grade school, and we also see that because, going back to the impact on the pregnant person, it's really important to know that PTSD, perinatal PTSD and perinatal depression are highly correlated. So when you see depression in a, in a postpartum or pregnant person, you need to be looking for trauma. And when you see perinatal depression, you're going to see, very likely, if it's not treated properly, you are going to see impacts on that developing child. We see lower IQs, we see behavior problems in kids really struggling with affect regulation. Why? Because you've got parents who are, who are themselves suffering and unable to stay attuned. <clears throat> These don't go away, just with time. We see impacts on bonding. Now, bonding is the relationship of parent to baby, to child, and attachment is the experience of the child to the parent. 
Can I count on you? Are you here for me? Okay, so a newborn will develop attachment and certainly recognizes a parent, but it's that bonding that we see from the parent. So remember earlier, one of the reasons, oh, don't do EMDR processing because, or do it because bonding. Well, here's the interesting thing. We, yes, um, but it's actually the depression that, that interferes with bonding, not the PTSD. So if you look at parents in the NICU, there's this kind of conventional wisdom that they don't bond well with their babies. I'm here to tell you that's not true. Bonding looks different when you have a, a two-pound baby than if you have a full-term healthy baby, and we all need to kind of get our heads around that idea. What does it mean to be protective when your baby is really, really fragile? What does it mean to be protective is gonna look different. And feeling protective, you don't feel protective about somebody you're not connected to, somebody you don't care about. So, so certainly we want to clear trauma because it is going to help with bonding, which is then going to help with attachment, yes? And if we don't treat it, we've got a highly activated parent who can't stay attuned. Right? And that's the core of it. Also impacts the couple's relationship, as you can imagine, right? You've got a preoccupied spouse, you've got a depressed spouse. And by the way, you know, these traumas affect both partners, gestational and non-gestational partners. It's just that the non-gestational partner may not be the one to get pregnant next time. So here, for, for our purposes today, we're concerned about the one who, who may then either be pregnant or get pregnant. Okay. So that's one category. So I think it's, I hope, very clear that what we want to avoid is toxic stress. And toxic stress is what's already happening in our clients. And if you think back to what Dr. Lanny has said this morning, and you think about the default mode network and those images, those brain images, and you've got somebody in a, in a chronic state of toxic stress, you've got somebody who's not able to keep a foot in the present moment, right? Who, who, who isn't main, able to maintain dual attention, right? Because they're falling into their experiences over and over and over again which is part of why it's so hard then to stay attuned to that baby, why it's so hard to stay in the present and listen to the doctors telling you what's going on, let's say, with your pregnancy. Thinking about making decisions, all the kinds of things parents have to do. And parenting starts when you're pregnant. The second category of stress is called tolerable stress. Tolerable stress can include the kinds of things that toxic stress in terms of like events, environmental events. But here's the difference. When there is an other who is there to buffer. So for a child, it may be one attuned adult. If you look at the resilience literature for, for children who've been, who were abused, and you may have all seen this in your offices over the years. You ever have somebody come in and tell you this you know, this childhood story, you know, of, of just, it's just devastating, and yet, they are functioning at a level that you're like, huh. And so I will look at them and I'll say, so who was it? And they're like, how'd you know? Because like, he showed me. He showed me, that's how I knew. Right, so, so we, so the to that makes toxic stress, it can transform it into tolerable stress. You know who else can help buffer? therapist. You know who else who can um, help activate the default mode network in a way that helps people to maintain a foot in the present moment? An EMDR therapist. Okay, so you've got somebody who's in this environment, whether that it's internal stuff, whether it's external stuff, or the, or the intersection, and you have a therapist who's doing good phase two work, and I'm here to advocate for really deep, rich phase two work that builds adaptive information and lights up that prefrontal cortex. And then we do our reprocessing to build that bridge and let that default mode network go, I know what to do. Thank you. Yeah? And then we make that stress more tolerable. Because sometimes, you know, we can't change the environment the way we might want to change the environment. But boy, we can sure change and, and build in some shock absorption for people. And that's what we're there to do. 
And then there's positive stress. Who knew? Positive stress. So here's the thing, y'all. We need some stress. And during pregnancy, that developing fetus needs to be stressed enough to develop their stress response neural networks. <clears throat> the stress of the mother or other pregnant person during pregnancy entrains the nervous system of that developing fetus. So we see that people who somehow have, you know, no, like no stress somehow during pregnancy versus people who had tolerable stress, adaptive stress, um, those, baby, those babies actually don't do as well. They need to have some, some shock absorbers that were built in to their system. Okay, so there are stressful things that we actually look for during the course of pregnancy. Anybody who's been pregnant ever have a non-stress test? So for those who don't know what that is, that's when in, towards the end of pregnancy, you get strapped to a fetal monitor where they're measuring the heartbeat of the baby and they're also measuring contractions. And every time you feel a contraction, you're supposed to push a button. Why? Because it's stressful for the baby, for the unborn baby, and they wanna make sure that the heartbeat goes up. This is heart rate variability. Heart rate variability is all about that, the, that the, the baby's nervous system responds to stress by increasing stress tolerance, which is what increased heart rate does. If you're under stress, your heart, rate, your heart beats faster because your body needs that, right? So that's an example of adaptive stress, and you need to have some of those experiences. That's why labor is not dangerous for babies. Which brings me to the other thing. You know what else is stressful is being born. <laughs> right? You, you, there's a couple of really important things that happen, particularly during vaginal delivery. The um, amniotic fluid is squeezed out of the lungs, and fetal heart, heart um, circulation switches from fetal to newborn. The heart pumps differently. And it's the stress that goes, oh, make a change. Now, I was on bed rest for six and a half weeks, starting at 24 weeks, and they gave me steroid shots every week. You know why? Stress. Steroid stress. <laughs> All the organ systems of the developing babies. In my case, it was two babies. Okay, so again, this is, are examples of like, stress is not evil. There, there, are, there are elements of stress, and we call it positive stress or adaptive stress, okay? And so we need to understand what kinds of stress are we looking at? in our EMDR therapy. For, for in, in a healthy pregnancy, a healthy stress response, we see that it is not static, that the body and the baby and the pregnancy respond to the variability in the environment, internal environment and external environment. We see that it's dynamic, changes, right? And we see that it's protective. What do I mean by that? So I wanna say something about cortisol because that's one of the, right? Something about cortisol, oh no, cortisol. Okay, so here's the thing about cortisol. We need cortisol. Cortisol is actually very helpful and protective to us at the right levels. Over the course of pregnancy, cortisol naturally increases. Protective, that it, that it um, creates a buffer for the developing fetus and then also for the pregnant person. So like, the research is funny, like it'll say like, so you know, if you're, if you're doing like guided meditation with them, you know, they kind of have a blunted response. <laughs> like, you know, instead of being like, wow, you get like, that was nice. <laughs> you know, it's just, there's, there's just some sort of muffling um, of that. And we think that that has to do with cortisol. Now, when we have untreated trauma, we see cortisol levels that go through the roof. We do not want to see that, but those are a response to toxic stress. Okay, so here again, I want to tell you, the thing that people are afraid of in our treatment is actually already happening. Okay? Okay. So now let's take a minute and look at EMDR. Because one of the things that has baffled me in this whole debate, and believe me, there have been some very contentious conversations that happen out there in the internet world and elsewhere, um, is this sense that because EMDR is powerful, it is therefore dangerous. And I wanna just sort of challenge that assumption 
There are certainly, we can certainly do harm. With any therapy, we can do harm, and certainly with EMDR therapy, that is not an exception. Um, but what is it that EMDR is doing to the body? And I'll say to you, what do you think we're doing with reprocessing? So well, let's look at the research. What actually is happening in the body? Well, what do you know? We see reduction in blood pressure, heart rate, uh, increase in heart rate variability, vagal tone. These are good things. We see de-arousal over time. We know this. We see this all the time. Our clients get less reactive, right? Maintain themselves better. This is what we see. We see better parasympathetic tone. This is vagal tone, right? People are not so choppy. So, so EMDR therapy reprocessing itself is pro-parasympathetic nervous system. It supports these adaptive functions in the body, neurobiologically, okay? It's, it's not wreaking havoc in the body. It's, it's increasing the persistence and um, intensity of the adaptive kinds of responses that we really need to see. So when we're thinking about EMDR and pregnancy, right, and stress, we need to remember that in general, mild to moderate levels of stress are adaptive, right? That the maladaptive stress is actually already happening. And what's really important to, um, that I want you to know in your, and the references are in your bibliography, is that we have looked at the impact of trauma-focused therapy on pregnancy to see is there harm in terms of outcomes, right? So we have all of this data in the perinatal mental health world about untreated or ina inadequately treated um, PTSD, anxiety, and depression on the pregnant person, the pregnancy, and the baby through life. And by the way, those impacts on the baby, those negative impacts, they last throughout life, just like the ACE stuff, right? It's the same, same thing, it starts then. Um, and so we're, we're like, okay, so, so what happens when, you know, when we look at, at adaptive stress? So, or we look at using EMDR therapy. And also, by the way, prolonged exposure, which is way worse, oh my God, in terms of intensity, right? No adverse outcomes. Nothing. We don't have any elevation in any of those obstetric outcomes that we talked about, we're not seeing those impacts on babies. So the fears of, I'm gonna hurt the unborn baby, I'm gonna hurt the pregnancy, they're gonna go into labor, oh no, something terrible is gonna happen, but we just don't see that in the outcomes. It's not supported by any data at all. It's omission bias. It's if I do something, I'm um, potentially endangering this person and their, their baby. And that is not supported by the evidence. What the evidence says is that inaction is higher risk behavior because we are leaving people in a state of toxic stress. And if I spent most of the time here today telling you all of the outcomes of toxic stress and pregnancy because they're really, really bad and they don't have to be. We don't have to do that to people. We need to remember that, the, that the, this unborn baby and this pregnant person are not at odds with each other. Can you hear somebody talk about ethics? It's unethical. We have to protect the baby. The baby and the pregnant person, the mother, are intertwined and interdependent, okay? So without a healthy pregnancy and person living that pregnancy, a baby's at risk. And certainly we know that the well-being of that, of that fetus, the well-being of that baby is, is of, of, of intense importance to the pregnant person and their partner, if there's a partner, um, at, over the course of pregnancy, right? They, people want to do right by their, by their family. I also want to tell you 
that it's not usually the clients who are afraid to do EMDR reprocessing. It's almost always the therapists. Mm -hmm. And we're often telegraphing our fear to clients and our avoidance. Okay? There, you know, you may have somebody with OCD coming in and they're afraid of every, you know, really afraid of everything. <laughs> so, you know, is it okay? Is it safe? You know, it's just, well, whatever you did, would it be safe? Remember also, by the way, that in our talk therapies, I don't know, people cry. People get mad. People get sad, right? Again, and remember, most of that is going to be depending on, again, the entire environment. You know, our ups and downs of life are, are considered adaptive stress, okay? And the research shows that EMDR therapy and other trauma-focused therapies resemble adaptive stress and not toxic stress. There's a really cool study in your bibliography about looking at um, uh, cortical steroid reaction in utero um, during and after amniocentesis, which is stressful. Amniocentesis is stressful. It's a great analog comparison. Um, and again, what we see is the outcomes are exactly what we're, just, we're talking about, that it resembles adaptive stress. There's no adverse outcomes. It, it doesn't look like toxic stress. It doesn't have that kind of impact on any of these dimensions that we've been talking about. So when we think about ethics, we need to think about this unit, supporting this unit, right? And remembering that when something is going to be good for the mother or other pregnant person, this is going to support this development of the, and the health of this pregnancy. So does that mean that no matter what, your client who walks in the door with complex trauma and is six months pregnant, you're like, yo, let's move through phase two and get into reprocessing tomorrow. Yeah. So, use best practices, okay? Do good EMDR work. What I'm responding to here and what I hope you will take away is that pregnancy itself is not a contraindication for any phase of EMDR therapy. Let me say that again. It's not the pregnancy itself that determines which phase or phases of EMDR therapy are okay to do. It's the same stuff we're always doing that determines what's appropriate to do. Do good phase one work. Do really good phase two work. Go back to phase two a lot. Phase two is all the time, as far as I'm concerned. We're always looking to build adaptive information. The client who you've been working with, where last week you said together, we know what our targets are, we're ready to move into reprocessing phases next week, let's do it, and they walk in the door today and they say, I've been dying to tell you, I'm 15 weeks pregnant. That client is no less prepared today because they told you they were pregnant than they were last week. Okay? Now, if that client can't stop, can't stop throwing up because they're, they've got hyperemesis or they're just yeah, pregnancy, use your best judgment. Maybe eye movements aren't a great idea. Okay? So, again, we're not saying, like, no, you must. Like, use your clinical judgment. But, again, it's not because you're pregnant we can't do this. It's like, you know, you're got some vertigo or you're nauseous or, you know, okay, let's see, let, let it pass and then we'll, we'll move into this work. Now, similarly, the client with complex trauma with whom you've been working and doing beautiful work, building adaptive information, okay, and, and you're not talking yet about moving into phase four reprocessing, who comes in and says, I've been dying to tell you I'm 15 weeks pregnant, you don't rush in and start doing reprocessing. Now, I will say, and I think I would say this about also non-pregnant people, is, you know, we want to be really thoughtful about how much we can effectively mitigate suffering. And so if you are somebody who uses things like CPOS, the constant installation of present orientation and safety, somebody who uses flash four blinks, something like that, that that can reduce intensity in ways that are more tolerable for people than standard protocol is, 
I would say, consider that. And maybe it's something you wouldn't, you hadn't thought about and thought we're doing all right. But now you know there's a pregnancy. Actually, maybe now I'm gonna see about this because there is, I know that there is palpable benefit to the reduction of that toxic stress in the body. Again, I would say there's always benefit to the reduction of toxic stress in the body. But, you know, again, something to consider, okay? And so ultimately what we want to see is that you are using and utilizing EMDR best practices in your work. Don't be afraid of pregnancy. If you are seeing clients who are coming in with, with a high-risk pregnancy, for example, you need to ask what kind of high-risk pregnancy because they are not the same. Okay? Somebody pregnant with twins is in a high-risk pregnancy. Obstetricians don't like multiple gestation. It's complicated. Mm -hmm. okay? Nothing about a twin pregnancy in and of itself is a contraindication for, for any phase of EMDR therapy. Now, if somebody's in the hospital with HELP syndrome, which H-E-L-L-P refers to the different organ systems that are shutting down, and they're in a dark room trying to not have a stroke, we're not going to do any processing that day. Right? We're thinking, right? Use your clinical judgment. Okay, again, don't use those blanket, but it's a high-risk pregnancy. It doesn't mean anything. It's a garbage pail term. Okay? It's just a general headline. It doesn't tell you much. You need to know more. And this is part of why I went through all those categories to just plant some seeds of like, you know, there's a lot of things that happen. You know, somebody can have placenta previa. It's not dangerous. Right? Placenta previa means that the that the um, Placenta is covering the opening the, the, so to the cervix. So if, that, if that's the case when somebody goes into labor, they could bleed. I mean, they could have an abruption meeting, and that's very dangerous. But they won't, because they'll have a C-section instead. Okay, just like the, the exit is closed. But, but that's not a high-risk pregnancy in the same way that, that something that's systemic in the body is high-risk pregnancy, okay? Um, and really, most high-risk pregnancies are not likely to be contraindicated anyway because they, they have nothing to do with, with what we're working on. And again, the reduction of the toxic stress is only going to benefit the entire system. Okay, so, so be thoughtful and please reach out to the, to the perinatal EMDR community. We are here. We want nothing more than to support you in your work and to help you to feel not alone, to know you're not alone, to know that you're, you can gain this, these competencies. We have uh, a beautiful collection of clinicians who are expert in perinatal mental health and approved consultants in EMDR, expert EMDR therapists in working with this population. Some of them are sitting right here. Mm -hmm. And I mean, truly, really, and also come, if you are on Facebook, come to EMDR and perinatal mental health. There is an international group of clinicians who work with this population at EMDR, generous, um, supportive, funny, nice, <laughs> you know, nobody bites. Um, there's lots of stuff that people don't know, just like new parents, you know. We all start off as beginners, and, you know, it's just, you know, come on in, the water's warm. We're here, we want to support you. Um, I hope that this information will help you when you are working with a client who is pregnant who would benefit from reprocessing to think through the decision making for, for your clients. Um, and if you are still not sure about something, you are not alone. Just know we are here. Um, and I would love, love conversation and questions, um, complaints. <laughs> permission or having the doctor give clearance and I had a feeling you were going to say that. Um, <laughs> so the doctor says, so the doctor says, what's that? Right. Okay. So could you collaborate with this doctor to educate or? You could, but they're going to tell you to do it. They're going to say, I don't know. They're going to say, I don't know. 
Um, again, from their perspective, I mean, they're going to look at you and say, I mean, what they're thinking is, why are you wasting my time? Mm -hmm. <laughs> For real. Because it's, it's like, uh, oh, if I can only get permission from the doctor, then it might clear me. It's, but again, it's like, this, is, this comes out of omission bias again. I'm going to do harm. I need permission, so I'm off the hook. Yeah. Right, right, right. Good. Okay, I'm glad you said that. Yeah, you don't, need to, you don't need to ask the doctor permission. Again, if you wouldn't ask the doctor permission to do CPT, you don't need to ask the doctor permission to do EMDR. Hello, Ricky. Hi, Maura. Okay, so I want to tell you how I've been teaching this, and I want you to tell me if this is wrong. <laughs> I will tell you. Okay. What I usually say is, yeah, we have special care for pregnant people. We don't want them to get too stressed out during the pregnancy. That's why we should do EMDR. <laughs> but, and uh, here's the exception that I want to run by you. Yeah. What if somebody has complex PTSD and it's going to be grueling session after grueling session, always with the risk of activation in between sessions, no matter how you put it away? Yeah. What I've been saying is if that's what it's going to be, is months and months of grueling stuff with risk of activation in between, maybe that be put off. Is that good advice or bad advice? If the client, if you have already been doing good work with the client, you may want to titrate a little bit more. You may need to fractionate the work a little bit so they have a little more recovery, but it's going to depend on the client. If you are in an ongoing treatment with somebody who is, who is, who is maintaining dual attention, who's doing the work, who can contain and ground between sessions, which is the criterion whether or not they're pregnant, right? Want to make sure that all that's on board because, of course, capacity is shift during pregnancy, right? Because we've got all these neuroendocrine changes. They may need more support. We may need to revisit some phase two work. But that's because we want to recognize the real impact of pregnancy on the body and the nervous system, right? And we just want to we want to kind of double check. We want to make sure everything's like kind of sealed and grounded, you know? We want to make sure that it's, it's okay. Um, and so, if they're they're doing that good work, I would not stop because they're pregnant. I would continue with good attunement. Okay, so in other words, go ahead, but monitor and make sure it's not messing the person up too much, basically. Right, and, and again, you would do that with somebody not pregnant, right? Um, but we want to reduce the toxicity in the, in the body, and it's going to help them to be prepared for this birth. Yes? Um, so I just want to say what a helpful presentation this was. Oh, um, it was really beautiful. Thank you. So, and then hopefully my next thought comes out as eloquently as it was <laughs> when I say in my seat. But what was striking me as you were talking is the period of perinatal is so long, right? And so many women have this extent yeah. beyond a three-year period. Oh, yes. It could be 10, 15. Oh, you bet. Right? So we're thinking about what's happening with the different types of trauma that yeah. can happen throughout, how those start to string together in the neural networks. Oh, yes. And so if we put this work on hold, what that means oh, yeah. Yeah, for yeah. how it can create complex trauma you for bet. these women. You bet. You bet. Thank you. Yes, absolutely right. And this, you know, I, as, as I'm thinking about talking about this topic, I'm like, don't go on a tangent, Mara. Don't go, on a tangent, Mara. Don't go over there. Don't go over there. Because you know, you just put me in, in a direction and hit play, and I'll go in that direction. So yes, thank you for that. And it's so true. And it hooks up with the old stuff, right? Um, at whatever level it was. So yes. Oh, I think you, and then yeah. Thank you. Um, let's see if I can articulate this. Um, it's a little bit of what. Um, what Suzanne was saying previously. A little louder. Okay. There you go. Okay. Do you want the hand help? Is that easier? <clears throat> Hold on. There you go. Hi. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it's better. Yeah, my voice doesn't care. I, w I was thinking about uh, if you could speak about titrating. Yeah. Not titrating, but kind of uh, doing that treatment planning because sometimes you do good work. Yeah. I've done a good work with pregnant women. And, and then the problem is we get to a good point, but I have to make sure that we stop at a good place yeah. and not don't stop don't start new things or big things because their head is in a different place during mm. you know, that last few weeks. Yeah. And then yeah. 
and many of them say they will come back after after, after birth, birth. And, then, and they don't. And they right. don't. And right. so you can't no, believe such that a great the question. Working, you yeah. know, interrupted because their head is in a different space. Yes. They're in, or things happen with the baby and they right. go through emergency. So Absolutely. how do you like, create that treatment plan, yes. even, even if you've done a good work? Yeah, it's such a good question. You know, and it really sort of speaks to the way we have to think about um, the developmental arc, this developmental period that is the perinatal period. And so some of the question has to do with when we get the client in, right? So how many people have had the clients that come in at 25 weeks pregnant? Wanting to work on all the things. And, right, and then you're like, oh God. So here's what I would have done if you came in a year ago. And here's what I'm gonna do now. And we have to think pragmatically. Remember why we do what we do. We are here to relieve suffering, to help support um, and accompany people on a healing journey. And people sometimes are going to do a bite of work. And that's what they're going to do right now. And then they're going to come back and do another bite. Maybe two. I don't know about you, but I have clients who have come in and out of treatment over my 30 years of practice, right? Mm -hmm. It's like they're going to dip their toe back in again. So in response to your, your question, which is, I think, so salient to pregnancy, of course, and that's why you're asking it. Is like we have a deadline, right? Um, sometimes the deadline comes early, <laughs> sometimes a little late. Um, and so, so I think what, you know one of the things that you probably have noticed, those of you who've worked with people during pregnancy, is that organically what happens is, if there's concern about labor and delivery, then attention naturally starts to move towards preparing for childbirth. And that's a very natural phenomenon, I think. And, and as always, there's collaboration. And what are we gonna work on? And if you can work on something that feels more, more circumscribed when you have less time, do that. Now, I am someone who, when I train, and I'm an EMDR trainer, I uh, teach phase one where you are always gonna do float backs, always. I want to know what's back there. That doesn't mean we're always gonna start there, but I wanna know what's back there. So it helps me to plan. For some people, again, depending on the complexity, depending on what they're in for, in their in, in treatment for, and depending on the your best guess and your best assessment and in collaboration about what those fuel tanks are leading to that's affecting them now, and particularly around preparing for labor and delivery, preparing for this baby, I might start back there because I think that's efficient if I can see that it's going sort of straight here. But sometimes, well, first of all, sometimes unicorns come in the door. I don't know, I've had a few of those where it's like, this is all, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me, and that's the only thing, and you're like, wow, that's really cool. Um, and then sometimes you see like, you know, okay, listen, we can, we can kind of keep this contained. And it's sometimes surprising, like, we, like I always expect it's gonna go straight back, but the nervous system, I trust the nervous system. Especially if I've done, you know, really solid with this person, good phase two work. That's the other thing, make sure people have really good containers. Now I'm, so I said, I'm a child psychologist, I'm a play therapist, like that's, the truth of this, I'm a, I'm a play therapist. So, you know, build one, draw one, sculpt one, you know, imagine one, act one out, you know, really and truly. Think about different ways to ground, different ways to contain, so that they have good ways to put it away, um, so that even if they don't come back, they have something, right, that, that they can help, you know, sort of zip it back up. Um, and so, this is the other thing that I would say, you know, come, come to consultation or come to EMDR on perinatal mental health, you know, come to, to sort of talk informally with people about this, how could you approach this? And you know, with maybe a few clinical details about, because you know, it's gonna depend. Um, but I think it's a fantastic question and something to really consider when we think about treatment planning. But phase two is super important when we think about these issues. 
And of course, my reflex is to go, anybody else? <laughs> and really, anybody else have any thoughts? Please, please contribute. Aloha, Dr. Stein. Mara, yes. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to say, first of all, how grateful I am and relieved to hear this presentation. So um, I've been using EMDR since 1997. And, yeah. And so uh, Francine Shapiro's 2018 words are what I've really uh, stuck with. Of course. And a shout out to Phyllis Klaus. Yes! <laughs> Who just finished her PhD, by the way. And oh. was she 80 oh, something? Oh, contact her. So Phil, let me just pause and just I have to tell people who Phyllis Klaus is if you don't know. No um, attachment and bonding, Marshall Klaus, Klaus and Kennel? Yeah. yeah? Phyllis Klaus is Marshall Klaus's wife. Been doing this work for decades and decades. Anyway, just, mm -hmm. just, anyway. Mm -hmm. yes. Shout out to Phyllis Klaus, who's done this work for shout ages. Shout out to Phyllis Klaus, whom I did not know was getting her dissertation. How lovely! Mm -hmm. uh, and her books, "When Survivors Give Birth." Yes. And so, between uh, Dr. Shapiro's uh, words and Phyllis's and pioneering, yeah. I have really just stuck to the, you know stuck really to the closeness of that omission thing you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, omission bias, yes. Mm -hmm. So in clinical consultation or even with our own team, I've been very conservative, waiting, waiting, waiting for research or really a permission from, you know, who's presenting on this, who's done the research. I'd like to go in there, but I don't want to hurt anyone. Absolutely. So I just have to tell you how grateful I am for that. Thank you so much. I'm for so grateful. Thank you. And we can thank the, the research team in, in uh, Norway, in, in the Netherlands, for pumping out this research. Um, they've done some really big scale studies with a lot, a lot, a lot of really powerful outcomes. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to stay away from specific case sure. references, but um, I'm concerned about the what might be the new normalization of C-sections. Oh, yeah. Um, and and um, so typically there's there could be a client who um, expected a normal a normal delivery and it turns out to be a C-section and oh well. Um, but um, and then I had a client suggest that uh, the use of pitocin to uh, induction. induce induction yeah. or to hurry things along um, causes a physiological response where the, the pregnancy can't uh, occur normally. That it, it uh, physiologically it, it overrides normal. whatever nor whatever sort of the uh, organic labor would be. The cervix can't expand appropriately. The, the baby can't prepare, and, and so there's all kinds of things. But I'm curious about this this normalization of C-section and and how the uh, the mother is it's sort of written off as oh well, and it really changes life um, in quite a absolutely way that. that for me, a guy, it's difficult to understand that. Yeah, yeah, why that's happening. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. So, wondering about how, are you wondering about how that has come to be, about the impact of that? Well, there's a, the, whole, the whole piece of being worried about, they might, they might have to, you know, for a woman who's pregnant, so you're expecting a normal pregnancy. Right, of and course. That, and then things, you're in the hospital, you may have a physician who just, they want to get, they want to go golfing. Well, I didn't want to say that. I didn't want to say anything bad about the, the medical. No, but it becomes scheduled, right? It becomes convenient, yes, it's right? And it's convenient for everybody. Well, you have a team of people that they, they're, they're there, and uh, they right. may not be there this afternoon or this evening. So I'm just curious about that uh, that whole piece in terms yeah. of the, the developing negative cognition for the future. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, that's that's fascinating. This is one of those, like, <laughs> um, So So here's what I'll say. So this is one of the things that when you have somebody coming in, let's say post prior C-section or traumatic delivery, prior traumatic delivery, and they're afraid of getting a C-section, or they may believe I'm a failure, right? My body failed my baby. You get the same thing with premature birth. My body failed my baby. Um, not good enough, right? But it depends on identity. So here, this brings us to, to birth plans, right? And this idea of like, <laughs> which started off as something I think really powerful, which is like, here's what's important to me during my birth. You know, here are some things that will help me, support me during my birth. But then it becomes, some, for some people, can be kind of like, and if this doesn't happen, it means I failed. Yeah. Or, you all failed me. It depends, right? We get, it depends, what's going on there? So yeah, there's a lot of, of potential trauma points 
around an unexpected C-section. Um, generally, uh, in my experience, when somebody's planning a C-section, there's not a lot of identity, parental identity connected with how they birth. But in some communities, there's a lot that's riding on how you birth. Did you have an epidural? Do you have any payments at all? Is it a surgical birth? Do you need intervention? You know, there can be so much meaning connected to the how, which by the way brings me to this question of what makes a birth traumatic. May not be what you think. How many times do we see OBs and midwives saying, that was a perfectly typical delivery, right? It doesn't matter what you think, medical person. Whether something is traumatizing is completely and totally subjective. That is the nature of trauma. You bet. That's right. That's right. And again, this isn't to say, and, and you, physician, have failed. The, it's like, no, but just listen. Listen to that experience, right? And what that meant. You thought, you know, you thought you were doing something typical, normal, whatever, and it wounded this person. You didn't know that was going to happen, but it did, right? So it kind of goes along with that philosophy of, like, you know, accept responsibility for what's real and learn, right? Pay attention and tune in these factors. Hi. Hi. Thanks for your presentation. Thank you. Um, and as someone who has been through EMDR as a pregnant person twice, uh -huh. I totally advocate uh, like uh -huh. where I align with you. Uh -huh. um, so my question is, what would you say to a client, well, let me back up. Earlier in your presentation, you had mentioned that pregnancy and the endocrine system can activate yes. previous trauma. Right. So if you do the flow backs and the client's not finding any previous mm -hmm. trauma, but yeah. they're still stuck in, mm -hmm. I'm going to kill my baby, or you know, these are actual oh, thoughts. Perinatal OCD. Yes. Mm -hmm. So in that circumstance, <laughs> what's <laughs> high? Here's our perinatal OCD expert, by the way, okay. and okay. sitting right here. Help, help me answer this question yeah. too. What, uh -huh. what would you say to a client if you do the flow backs yeah. and perinatal OCD? Yeah. You don't find any history of trauma. Are uh -huh. you just like doing bad flowbacks, or do you need to target something different? So there's two things I want to say about OCD. This is great questions, y'all. You have to come to the touchstone table in the venture room so we can all like sit around and talk and have some tea. Yeah. Um, okay, so first of all, there's different kinds of OCD. Okay, you need to know family history. So if you see generational OCD, they need a psychiatric, perinatal psychiatric consult. Okay. Don't sit on it, don't wait. OCD is awful. Perineal OCD is terrifying. People think they're psychotic, okay? And clinicians get confused and scared. Because when they say, when a parent says things like, I'm gonna throw my baby out, I, 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 am, I can see myself throwing my baby out the window, they think, oh my God. But what you need to say is, and what, how do you feel about that? And they say, I, I'm not going anywhere near my baby. That's OCD. It's when they say, and God told me, and I'm going to follow them out the window, that's psychotic. All right? So again, like this is, we're here for you. Got your back. Um, so first of all, you need to know, like, does this look like organic CD, right? Get on an SSRI. High dose. Okay? By the way, the omission bias gets used in medication during pregnancy. I just have to share this. If you are seeing a pregnant person who's been on an SSRI successfully and their doctor says to get off the SSRI, scream at the top of your lungs, first of all. I will hear you. And then, because I will be joining you. Um, don't, no, no, no. There is, again, a raft of data, a mountain of data, supporting the safety and, again, the benefits of better to be treating this anxiety and the depression with these medications that are benign as any medication can be in pregnancy. Um, again, all the things I listed about before, this is, what, this is what happens when people don't get the appropriate medication treatment also during a pregnancy. So you're gonna find that. And then it could be that you need to do an affect scan or a somatic flood back, and what they're gonna get is a fragment. And then the third thing is treat the present trigger. Just treat the present trigger and do a flash forward and treat the intrusive thought. So you're gonna go forward and you're gonna juice that thing. You're gonna, the most gruesome, you, that's just, we want the worst part, right, of the prior stuff. I want the worst part of that intrusive image, and we're gonna desensitize it. Standard protocol. Thank you. You're welcome, good question. <laughs>
Morgan, yes. And resource a whole bunch. And resource, this is our perinatal OCD expert, stand up. Hi. That's what you want to consult with. And just um, lots of resourcing and just postpartum support international. If you, depending, yes. um, a lot of medical people don't know what to do with OCD in general. They really don't know what to do perinatally. Postpartum Support International has medical people who can assist. And so go on their website and they have, um, part of their website has people that can assist medical personnel. They will assist them with how to help in any format possible with proper medication and so forth. So please go there. Thank you. And you can find um, Morgan Rahimi's um, contact information on the Touchdown Institute mm -hmm. website under consultants. She's our, really our perinatal OCD expert. Thank you. Yes. One of the issues that I've been running into is that a lot of clients are educated medically about what's happening and like what to expect when they're giving something like Pitocin during birth. Mm. I'm curious about the ethics of like explaining that as a therapist because that's something that I'm totally comfortable doing. But Absolutely. also there's been a lot, I think, with licensing boards recently about like not giving medical advice or information. It's not advice. Okay. It's not advice. This is all adaptive okay. information. Okay. Right? So anything you can do to be transparent, contextualize, offer resources, absolutely do it. Okay. Because we're flattening the hierarchy. Thank you. Yeah. I, I just wanted to clarify something from your sure. presentation. So I, I believe I heard that you said that women can be induced and that kind of lead to higher rates of C-section. Correct. Okay, so I just want to clarify. So something I've been familiar with more recently is the recommendation by ACOG to induce at 39 weeks to decrease the risk of preeclampsia. In 2023, that is written. So what do you, I mean, and this is like neither, neither here nor there, maybe with EMDR therapy, but just thinking about like, where are we getting our information? What are we encouraging our clients with and what are we not? And so, you know, there's, yeah, there's a lot of information. Right. So, he, so, so this brings us. These are great questions, and so he, now you're going to get a peek into like when I talk about EMDR and perinatal mental health and, and developmentally supportive and relationship-based care and what we're doing here. So here's how I would think about those kinds of questions. We often will have a client who will come in and say, "I don't want to be induced. I don't want another C-section because of all the wounding and impacts." And so what I do. And so again, think about this through the AIP lens. I want to build adaptive information. And, and you know, we have our, our trauma themes, right? We have safety, choices, responsibility, belonging. But we also have our perinatal mental health themes, which came out of the research that I've done over the years in the books that, that I've co-written with Debbie Davis. Developing parental identity around this baby, managing affect, emotions, which include bonding, grief, trauma, and managing relationships. So I want to support this client in their developing sense of self as a parent, which includes the management of their pregnancy, and the relationship that they have with their doctor or midwife. So I will talk with them about ways to engage with their, with their um, reproductive caregiver to say, so how are we making, how are we making this decision? What are the indications, right? How will you know when? It really, we, we, there's an indication that I'm at risk and that it's better for me, for my pregnancy, for my baby, to do this procedure, to do this intervention. And here's what happens. When clients, when people engage that way and have true collaboration with their team, when interventions are necessary, they're not traumatized by them. They were part of the decision-making process. And I always tell healthcare providers, parents don't want your job. Parents have a job. You need to make space for that reciprocity, that attunement, that back and forth. There's things that parents know that you can't know. There's things that a pregnant person knows, but what matters to them Right? You are a guest in their world, and they are a guest in your world. You're both a host and a guest. 
And so we need both of you, and we need that conversation, right? And so the doctor can say, look, here's the research, right? It's not a secret. Look at the research, here's the risks, here are the indicators. Are you in a risk category? And they can say, I'd rather come in and be monitored more, or I'd rather wait until X, Y, Z. Okay, and, and will you agree that if I say to you, knowing how you feel, I think it's time, what will help you know that you can trust me? Right? And so that's how we build those relationships. Real quick. Sure. Just a little bit more about postpartum. Sure. So kind of touching on your social media thing, the mental load. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about the connection of incorporating partners and spouses. Oh yeah. In the stress that women, especially in the first couple of weeks, are coming with like- It's a three day workshop, you know, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> yeah, all of that, like what kind of weather, you've got a lot of information, which is like the majority- I Get the book her. Fair Play. Which you all probably already have. Hulu has a really good document. Yes, 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 yes. Look, these are these are huge questions, and absolutely right. When when pregnant people are essentially carrying all of the loads, it's going to increase stress. Absolutely. Um, and so yes, there's. I think there's an ethical and I just clinical um, reason to say, hey, we need to balance this load um, because it's a lot. It's a lot not being pregnant, and it's certainly a lot being pregnant, right? There's a lot of psychoeducation that has to happen, you know, and a lot of unlearning of, of habits of like, this is what makes me a good enough, a good enough person, a good enough partner, a good enough pregnant person, a good enough mother, a good enough whatever, a parent, right? What I need to do, who I need to be, how I need to be. Um, these, they, they didn't happen today. It came from somewhere, right? So we know. Um, but yeah, certainly, I would, I, um, in support of, you know, really, we want to, everybody needs support. You know, the other people who need support, just as a segue, are healthcare providers. Mm -hmm. Help be supporting the healthcare providers. When you think about developmentally supportive care, we provide care for babies in, in newborn intensive care and everywhere else to help their nervous systems to develop properly. We need to provide support to parents so they can do that for babies. But who's, who's providing that for the healthcare provider? Who's providing it for parents? We need to do that. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be in this room because um, I'm new to counseling uh, because I took a career change. I used to be a certified nurse midwife. Oh. <laughs> what a perfect transition. For 17 years, I worked wow. in a hospital with all kinds of birthing people. Um, from birth center, all natural, to high risk, everything. Yay. Before that, I was a NICU nurse. Oh, so oh, I, man. I was, I'm that root oh, person that I'm like, oh, NICU, oh, these are bad outcomes. Oh. Like, let's help the moms. And like, let's do more kangaroo cares, people. To, to this generation, and now I'm trying to help the moms as a midwife when you talk about your trauma. So there I am, like, trying to elbow <laughs> off, like, stop touching her and don't say those things. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and then they all listen. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but also seeing so many um, people come to birth or pregnancy with their trauma already there and yeah. doing nothing about it. Like, right. they'll eat gummy bears and, and drink Mountain Dew oh, for yeah. breakfast and go to a cardiologist because you got faint, but don't go see your mental health professional because oh, no, no. you self-identify as having trauma. So so then it, it leads into this, like, perpetuation of yeah. they have trauma, so now they won't go into labor, they won't labor well, so now we have to do these things to them. And right, the right, right, right. Traumatic and the postpartum is traumatic. Like right. even hyperemesis oh, research yeah. says that's because of mental health stuff. You're more hmm. likely to have these kinds of things. So yeah. and it's just being ignored and passed on to the generation. Absolutely. So even what you were saying about you know the neural pathways being developed because of steroids and because of trauma and because uh -huh. of a certain amount of stress. We know in the NICU that who are the most resilient little black girls. That's right. And That's then right. we have our wimpy white boys. Wimpy white boys. <laughs> <laughs> you say that it's, it's generational. Like it is, and it's, it, 
then that's not new information. No. But you know, as mental health professionals, I think it's really important to see like the, the huge dynamics. And like you said, with our pregnant people who come in and you're like, okay, I only got like a few weeks. Right. Right. You're up. It's Ten like, days. Like try to minimize how much more trauma happens. Absolutely. In the birth. So, Absolutely. This is primary good. prevention. That's why this is called primary prevention. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Me. Thank you, everybody. I'll be here the whole conference. I'm probably going to mostly be sitting at the touchstone table, so I would love to meet people and have more conversation.